Now we're going to move on to the topic for this chapter, which is dealing with multiple hypothesis tests. So now the situation is that we don't have just one hypothesis or one null hypothesis we want to test, but m different ones. And as I mentioned at the start, we've had this sort of concept in statistics forever, but the typical value for m was very small, single digits, uh, two or three, something like that. And the methods for adjusting in that situation worked pretty well. But these days, we often have situations where we want to test thousands or tens of thousands of hypothesis tests, and the complications from that become even larger. So suppose that we simply rejected all null hypotheses for which the corresponding p-value falls below, say, 1%. So what happens if we do that? Then if we reject all of those null hypotheses that, that fall below 1%, how many type 1 errors are we likely to make? A lot. Turns out if M is large, a lot. And to sort of illustrate that idea, we constructed a little thought experiment here. It's, it's not a very exciting one, but I think it does il illustrate pretty clearly the issue that you can run into here. So let's suppose that we just pick a coin and uh, we flip it 10 times to check if it's fair. And by the way, my sons uh, uh, both uh, have statisticians as parents, so they do this quite a bit just for fun. <laughs> I was thinking, too bad we don't have a coin right here. We could demonstrate this. As you're going to see, it's going to involve flipping a coin a whole bunch of times, but I'm sure you guys don't have anywhere to go. So, so well, let's just pr pretend we sort of edited that out and we got, got oh, to the right, end yeah. point here. So um, if we just did this once and we tossed this coin 10 times, then we'll probably get approximately the same number of heads and tails, roughly five heads and five tails. And if we calculated a p-value, for, uh, for that null hypothesis that the coin is fair, i.e. it has a 50% chance of landing on heads or tails, then it's most likely that we'll get a relatively large p-value and we won't reject the null hypothesis. That's the whole way that hypothesis tests are constructed. But now let's imagine that instead of just flipping one coin 10 times, we somehow find under the sofa 1,024 fair coins. At this point, it's very clear that this is just a thought experiment. <laughs> okay. You haven't seen my sofa. But, uh, so then we flip this coin, each one of these coins, 10 times. So we now, this could take a while, so we'll edit that part out. But if we do that, why did we choose 1,024 as the number here, Daniela? I think it's because that's 2 to the 10th, Gareth. And so the probability that if we flip one coin 10 times that we get 10 tails is exactly 1 over 1,024, 1 over 10 to the, uh, 2 to the 10. So if we flip that many coins 10 times, then on average, we would expect to get about one coin where it came tails every single time. And if we were to perform a hypothesis test on that one particular coin, we'd get a p-value of about 0 0.002, so a very small p-value. And why is it 0 0.002, Gareth? Because the probability of a coin coming up tails 10 times in a row is only 0 0.002. Or coming up heads uh, 10 times in a row. So, right, because it's 1 over 1024 plus 1 over 1024. There's two ways that we could get this extreme an outcome. Because we would be really surprised. If we think that the coin's probably fair, and that's our null hypothesis, we'll be really surprised if we get 10 tails. We'd be equally surprised to get 10 heads, presumably. So that's why to get the p-value, it's 1 over 1024 plus 1 over 1024. Because we're not specifying that it's more likely to be tails or heads under the alternative. It's just not equal. So if we were to look at that one particular coin and do a hypothesis test on that coin, it's almost certain that we would end up rejecting the null hypothesis. The other coins, maybe we don't reject. But the point here is that if we perform enough hypothesis tests, even when we ins insist on a very small p-value, it's almost certain that we'll make some, in this case, type 1 mistakes. This would be a type 1 mistake because these coins are, in fact, fair. The null hypothesis is true. But at least for that particular coin, we've incorrectly rejected it. And this slide here, I think, this cartoon sort of illustrates this idea pretty nicely. So I'm not sure if you can read this on the screen, but the concept here is that uh, they perform a hypothesis test on jelly beans to check if there's a relationship between jelly beans and acne. 
And of course, there is no relationship between jelly beans well, and, and acne. I mean, we should probably do the experiment, Gareth. <laughs> I don't like jelly beans, so I'm not going to do it. But if, if you want to, you can try. But in this particular cartoon, at least, they found no relationship. They had a large p-value. But then the claim was, well, maybe it's not jelly beans in particular. It's particular colors of jelly beans. So you, you notice here that we have exactly 20 of these cartoons corresponding to 20 different colors in the rectangular big box. And that color corresponds to 20 colors. And for 19 of those colors, they also failed to reject a null hypothesis with a p-value of 5%. But it turned out that the green jelly beans had a p-value below 5%. And so you see suddenly here that there's a newspaper story that green jelly beans are linked to acne. Uh, but the reality is we just performed a large number of hypothesis tests. Probably the null hypothesis was true in every one of them. Uh, but if we do enough, we're almost guaranteed to get one false positive. And so this relates to all the reproducibility issues and things as well that happen these days. And it also relates to the idea that if you want to either sound really smart or be really annoying, potato, potato, then whenever you see a headline about any kind of scientific or social science study or anything like that, you can just be like, I think they had a multiple testing problem. And like, you're, number one, you're probably right, but also very annoying. Yeah. Statisticians don't get invited to a lot of parties. <laughs> that is definitely but true. But there's probably more than one reason for that. That's true, yeah. Okay, so this just sort of illustrates the challenge that we have in doing a hypothesis test, that if we test these large number of hypotheses, all of which are true, we reject any null hypothesis with a p-value below, say, 1%, then we're going to have approximately 0.01 times m, whatever the value of m is, null hypotheses that we falsely reject. So that's type 1 errors. We're going to have 0.01 times m type 1 errors. If all of the null hypotheses were true. So for example, if we had 10,000 tests and all of the null hypotheses were true, then we'd expect to falsely reject about 100 null hypotheses by chance. So suddenly there's 100 newspaper articles about these fantastic discoveries at a very low p-value, when the reality is we just performed too many hypothesis tests, or at least without correcting for that, that issue. So a lot of type 1 errors, false positives. All right, so then what's sort of an approach that we can take to try to deal with this situation? We just discussed that if we perform enough of these hypothesis tests, we're almost certain to have some type 1 errors. We don't want type 1 errors. So how can we try to control for the situation where we're doing a lot of these tests? And the sort of most classical approach here is something called the family-wise error rate. And the family-wise error rate is just defined as the probability that we make at least one type 1 error. So if you think about it, if you have a low family-wise error rate, then you're saying that there's a low probability of making any type 1 errors. Sounds great, right? So this table here is just sort of an analogous table to Daniela's one that she showed us earlier. This again has sort of the four possible situations, the two possible real states of the world and the two possible decisions that we could make here. And the letters here just represent if I do M of these hypothesis tests, how many of those tests fall into each of these four buckets. And so for example, the bucket that we're really concerned about here is the one where HO is true, but we reject HO. That's the type one error. H, H not. He means H not. <laughs> HO is true. <laughs> so V here, the, the letter V here just represents the number of type one errors that we're making out of M hypothesis tests. So the family wise error rate here is by definition, the probability that V is greater than one. So to be clear, we we know how many null hypotheses we've rejected, and we know how many we haven't rejected. So we know R, and we know M minus R, and of course we know M, which is the number of hypothesis tests we've conducted. But we don't know which column, what the values in the columns are. So we don't know the value of V, we don't know the value of S, and so on. Right. But we can, in general, calculate or at least approximate the probability that V is greater than 1 or this family-wise error rate, or we can hope to try to control what that value is. And that's what we're going to talk about now, uh, some approaches for trying to control that family-wise error rate. And just before we go on from that, I just want to say, Gareth, in your courtroom analogy, I think that um, the idea here was we have M defendants, each of whom is being put on trial, and V corresponds to finding one of the defendants guilty when, in fact, none of them are guilty. And we would be really, presumably, we would not want to find even one of the M defendants guilty if, in fact, they're all innocent. 
So that's why we're stressed about the possibility of V being greater than or equal to one. We want that family-wise error rate, the probability of wrongfully convicting someone to be very, very small. Wrongly convicting anyone among the M right. to be very small. What, how does it go better to let 10 innocent people go, uh, 10 guilty people go than to convict one innocent person? So. Although here they're all innocent because the family-wise error rate we're thinking about, then all hypotheses all being true. Right. Okay, so controlling the family-wise error rate sounds like a good thing. If we have a small family-wise error rate, we're likely to make no type 1 errors. But in practice, it's often hard to actually control that. And, and this formula here sort of illustrates how you might calculate the family-wise error rate. And what it's really saying is that it's equal to one minus the probability of the intersection that we do not falsely reject the jth null hypothesis. Now in practice, that probability is hard to uh, calculate in a general situation. But if we simplify things and imagine that each of our hypotheses tests are independent, so that intersection becomes a product of the individual probabilities, and we assume that all the null hypotheses are true and we only reject if the p-value is less than alpha, then it's not too hard to show that that family-wise error rate is equal to this 1 minus alpha all to the m quantity. And so what does that look like for different values of m and different values of alpha? So this plot here just shows for three different values of alpha, 5%, 1%, and 0.01%, and different values of m, what happens to that family-wise error rate. And the dotted line down the bottom is, is at the 5% level. So if you wanted to have a family-wise error rate of 5%, what value of m is going to work for that? And basically what this shows you is that when m gets even moderately large, you can end up with family-wise error rates that are close to 100%. So in that sense, the family-wise error rate is not helping you at all because you're almost certain to make at least one type 1 error here. So, so the way we read this plot is if you look at the purple curve, like when m equals 50, so when you're at 50 on the x-axis, the purple curve is right around 0.05. And so that means if you reject any null hypothesis, if, p, if its p-value is below 0.01, but you have 50 null hypotheses, then there's a 5% chance of making a family-wise error, a type a, 1 error. Type one, yeah. At least one type 1 error. But you can see that once you get up to, say, 500 here, even at that very, very low value of alpha, you're already up to about a 40% chance of making at least one type 1 error. So this family-wise error rate is essentially a very hard quantity to control for very large values of m. And the only way to control it is to have your alpha be tiny. And remember, alpha is the type 1 error that you're trying to control, so it's like the threshold at which you're going to reject the null hypothesis if you see a p-value less than that alpha.